All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the series Mud Talks, Chemistry in 17th Century New England with Gary Patterson, class of 68. My name is Vanessa Chu, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni and Parent Relations. We thank you for attending today's event, and we hope you and your family are safe and healthy during this time. This talk is being recorded and will be distributed after the event. Please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to get through as many questions as we can. Now, to briefly introduce our speaker, Gary Patterson is a professor of chemistry emeritus at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. He is a member of the board of directors of the Science History Institute in Philadelphia and the chair of its Heritage Council. Gary studied chemistry at MUD and obtained his PhD in physical chemistry from Stanford. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker, Gary, take it away. Thank you. There we go. So there are many paths to becoming a chemical adept. For me, it started with a great high school chemistry teacher. One of the most important things I learned from him was to join a group of other serious chemists in my journey. The obvious next step was Harvey Mudd, still the best place in America to become a chemist. For graduate school, I chose Stanford because Paul Flory was there. He earned the Nobel Prize in 1974, soon after I graduated from his lab. Those were exciting days at Stanford, and I was treated as a full-fledged member of the community of adepts. AT&T Bell Laboratories, where I worked for many years, was the largest collection of chemical adepts in the world in 1982 when I joined them. I was in the chemical physics department. When the government canceled Bell Labs, I and a thousand of my friends became university professors in 1984. I chose Carnegie Mellon University because I would have full freedom to interact with a large community, including joint appointments in chemical engineering and strong ties to both physics and material science. In the 21st century, I followed my passion to become a chemical historian and I'm now associated with the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. This is the central place in the worldwide community of chemical historians. Now, the book on which this talk is based uh, is called Chemistry uh, in 17th Century New England. And, and it came out of a symposium that I organized at an American Chemical Society meeting in Philadelphia on chemistry in America before seven, 1876. And I'm still the historian of the history of chemistry division of the ACS, and I'm still actually pursuing American chemistry as, as one of the streams uh, of history uh, that I produce books in. Now, it may come as a surprise uh, that chemistry played such an important role in the founding of New England, and an even bigger surprise that an American was one of the founders of the Royal Society of London. But the story of John Winthrop Jr. Uh, illustrated here uh, in this picture is one of the best tales of the 17th century. Uh, this picture hangs in the uh, art museum at, at Harvard University. He did not attend uh, Harvard University, but he gave them many, many things. And the, the Winthrop family finally uh, gave Harvard uh, this particular picture. Now, Winthrop was to the manor born. Uh, he was born in Groton, Suffolk. His father, uh, John Winthrop Sr., of course, was the governor of Massachusetts eventually. Uh, and because of that, he was educated at the Free Grammar School at Bury St. Edmunds. It's a very famous school. We're going to learn a little bit more about it. But one of the most important things, if you were the eldest son of a lord, uh, was that you needed to learn Latin because you were going to have to use it uh, one way or the other. Now, this particular grammar school, uh, meaning Latin school, uh, was founded by the King Edward the Edward the Sixth, uh, and he went to college not at Oxford or Cambridge. Oxford or Cambridge were not good Puritan schools, and so he chose Dublin a College, uh, where it was reliably Puritan. After that, uh, he became a lawyer in the Inner Temple in London, and you figure, well, how does a lawyer end up being a chemical adept? Well, young lawyers in London, you know, they needed to have a job to be respectable, but there wasn't an awful lot of work for them. So they had plenty of time on their hands. And the question is, what did he do with all this wonderful time that he had on his hands? Well, he met Edward Howes, uh, a fellow adept, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about him. 
But chemistry in the 17th century had many forms. The metals industry was well developed. There were pharmacists and there were many artisanal industries necessary for daily life. But there was also a less visible community of alchemists who were probing the mysteries of matter. In order to join this group, it was necessary to learn Latin. And so that's where he went to school. Uh, further instruction in Latin and the liberal arts uh, uh, prepared him, uh, in fact, to be both a lawyer and a governor, since he ended up being the governor of Connecticut. But more importantly for him, uh, it allowed him to become an alchemist uh, and to be welcomed in all the courts of Europe. He was one of the most uh, well-known and personable politicians uh, in the world uh, in the 17th century. Now, one of the other lawyers at the Inner Temple was Edward Howes, uh, who came from a family of alchemists, it turns out. Uh, and uh, he started sharing his alchemical books with, with John Winthrop Jr. Uh, and it's one thing to read books, but you don't become an addict by reading books. And at Harvey Mudd, you don't become a scientist or an engineer uh, just by reading books. You actually have to do it. And so the second most important thing was to carry out the work. That's what alchemy was called. It was called the work. Uh, and they did actual alchemy together uh, in London and they continued to correspond for the rest of their lives. So they became really good friends as well as alchemists. Now, when Winthrop ended up in America, he often sent him books uh, to America along with chemicals and equipment and whatever else. But it, uh, alchemy was a, a highly infectious for thinkers and doers like John Winthrop, but in order to catch it, you needed to get it from another alchemist. That was one of the things I learned at Harvey Mudd, that science was the disease, but you had to catch it from somebody who had it. Harvey Mudd is very infectious. For uh, the practice of alchemy, you had to read the books, and then you had to practice with those books open to see if you were really reading them correctly. It wasn't always easy to read uh, those kinds of books, but you needed a community of alchemists to talk to and compare notes. And in the end, of course, nobody ever made the Philosopher's Stone, but they did make an awful lot of chemicals and they were able to impact the world in which they lived uh, in many different ways. And Winthrop, in a, impacted his world in all of those ways. We're going to learn a lot, lot about that kind of thing. One of the things he did was collect books. He had the finest library in America in the 17th century, and 275 of those books were alchemical books. Some example of 16th century volumes, uh, Arnold of Villanova and Raymond Lowell were famous alchemists, revered by all of the 17th century alchemists. George Ripley was an English alchemist and wrote in English, the compound of alchemy. Uh, so that one didn't have to be translated from the Latin. Now that he also, of course, had 17th century value. Basil Valentine uh, was a very good practicing chemist. And unlike a lot of the alchemical books that were really hard to read and understand, they were written in mystical language and whatever else, Basil Valentine also wrote a book on antimony called the chariot of antimony. And the recipes in there can be done today and you get exactly what he got and described exactly how to do it. So, so those were good. Uh, and you know, there's just some other examples of 17th century volumes that we own, but these classic works and Winthrop owned them all. He could have brought all that. Another one face page was D-Ray Metallic that allowed uh, the Europeans and to make all the matter of metals. Uh, and in England, they could do that. So uh, this particular book was used by Winthrop in America because he found it in ironworks. Another book that mattered to him a lot is called the Monus Hieroglyphica uh, by John Dee, uh, the same fellow who went to this uh, grammar, same grammar school. Uh, and this is perhaps the most famous of the alchemical books of the 16th century. And of course, Winthrop had his own copy. Uh, he also had other books by John Dee that were given to him by the family. John Dee died uh, before uh, Winthrop uh, 
you know, about the time Winthrop was born. So I didn't meet him in person, but he did meet the family and he did collect a lot of his books. Here's a nice picture of John Dee. Uh, and he's shown there with, with Queen Elizabeth. John Dee was the court physician to Queen Elizabeth. Now, alchemists needed money and they needed support and they needed patronage. And so it was a win-win situation. Queen Elizabeth had a good physician. He was probably the most single most educated man uh, in England at the time. He tr even translated Euclid out of Greek uh, into English. And the, his translation of Euclid is still, the, still a good one uh, to, to read in England. So uh, D was one of the greatest adepts of the seven, 16th century. And he had two principles. One of them is chemical truth is found in the laboratory, not just in books. You can't be an alchemist or a real chemist in the 21st century if all you do is read. You really have to learn how nature actually behaves, not the way some book says it behaves. The other thing which we're really unused to hearing in the 21st century is that God, uh, D believed that God chose to communicate arcana to a few men who were prepared to receive this knowledge since it was a gift of god a bonum day it must be valued and protected now these days we don't routinely believe that uh, the adepts were elect uh in in a religious sense but they did and they that's one of the reasons that they kept things secret was because they felt that the, this knowledge, if it got out into the vulgar world, would be abused um, by the rest of the world. Well, that's an interesting um, issue for today. Now, the um, while there were chemical adepts in England, there were many more in Europe that he hadn't met yet. And his father uh, funded an alchemical wonder year. It was common for the, the oldest son of the aristocracy to take a year or two and do the grand tour uh, of Europe. Well, his grand tour was done in a slightly different way. He booked passage on a, on a freighter. Uh, and so he, he, you know, he worked for the captain, but uh, as a secretary, but basically he had lots of time to read and lots of time to meet alchemists all over Europe. One of the ones he met was Cornelis Drebbel, one of the most noted adepts of the 17th century. Uh, Drebbel was welcome in the courts of both England and Europe because he put on the best entertainments of anybody. He knew all about hydraulics, optics. Uh, he could do illusions, you know, like a 21st century illusionist. Uh, but he was a great chemist. And one of the things he invented was a, a red color uh, which you probably recognize on the guards uh, at Buckingham Palace. That's Cornelis Red. Uh, that he and his two sons, Abraham and Johann Kuffler, became good friends with Winthrop, and interacted with him, shared books, shared practices, and in addition, they were medical doctors, not from the College of Physicians, which were Galenic. Uh, doctors who were most likely to bleed you to death. Instead, they were iatrochemical uh, practitioners uh, that, you know, would probably make you uh, sweat and uh, do other things, uh, but wouldn't kill you. Uh, so th they were of that kind. And another person that he met was Jacobus Golius, which was a, a politician uh, who taught him all kinds of things about what you really had to do to make your way in the world if you needed to spend time at court and, and whatever else. So he had lots of good friends from different worlds, in, including the alchemical world. Now, when his father, uh, when he returned uh, from his wonder year, his father uh, was uh, preparing the Puritan emigration uh, to New England with the Massachusetts Bay Company. And so uh, he left his son behind to sell the family estate and to prepare for the next emigration of Puritans. So the, the Puritans, unlike the pilgrims that had come 10 years earlier, made sure to have a full range of artisans 
who could do all the things necessary to have a working community, a commonwealth is what they called it. Uh, and so they needed money uh, and they needed more uh, immigrants. So uh, when John Winthrop Sr. set sail for New England, he left him behind to sell the family estate and to prepare for the next emigration of Puritans. And he did such a good job that when he arrived in Boston, he was elected a member of the board of the Massachusetts Bay Company, and he served that commercial entity for many years. One of his earliest projects was to found the town of Ipswich, uh, which is still there. Uh, and the colonization of New England depended on occupying the new land and settling the villages uh, so that they could be self-supporting. Now, Winthrop is unusual in that he actually bought the land for Ipswich from the Native Americans and had to pay twice because there were always tri multiple tribes that claimed the land uh, that was being purchased. So sometimes Winthrop needed to buy three rights uh, to a mine for something because there were three tribes that, that wanted money out of him. But he always paid for the land uh, that he used. It was very unusual for, for that particular time. So he came to New England, he bought more books, he set up his furnaces and started manufacturing iatrochemical medicines so that he could practice medicine in New England. There were very few practitioners of any kind, uh, especially college of physicians type uh, medical doctors in New England. But you know, people got sick and, and they needed care and whatever else. So, so he was early um, into this business. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about New England that's not widely appreciated, but really was very important at the time. And uh, after founding Ipswich, uh, not enough people were coming to uh, New England. And it, it turns out it's kind of a Ponzi scheme that the early settlers, you know, get free land, they develop it. And when new people come, they want to sell it to them uh, and set up. So you need fresh money coming all the time. So uh, John Winthrop went back to uh, England in, in 1635 to recruit more Puritans. Uh, he bought more books and chemical apparatus. He interacted with the Cuffler brothers again. Uh, and he once again visited all the Puritan uh, lords to encourage them to send people uh, to uh, New England and to send money, you know, to support the Puritan uh, Commonwealth in, in New England. And uh, Winthrop Jr. was very good at, at doing the, that kind of stuff. Now, he came back, he returned to Ipswich. Uh, and while he was there, uh, another person from England on his own dime, not as part of any big group, uh, booked passage on a ship to New England. His name was Robert Child. He was a, 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 a trained, an Edinburgh trained uh, medical doctor. Uh, he was an alchemist and he became fast friends with Winthrop and they practiced alchemy together and corresponded for the rest of their lives. And they were both members of what we're gonna learn more about later is called the Hartlieb Circle. In England, there was a Samuel Hartlieb was kind of an intelligencer and he gathered people around him who wanted to talk about natural philosophy and husbandry and you know all the things that make a society great and whatever else. Uh, and so both Robert Child and John Winthrop Jr. were considered members of the Hartlieb Circle. They corresponded, they shared uh, all kinds of things. And later on, Robert Child, you know, then went back to England after this first trip. He returned to New England uh, in 1645, uh, and he was planning on joining uh, Winthrop in an alchemical plantation that we'll learn a little bit more about, but we'll also discover, you know, what else ha happened to him. Now, one of the other things that the colonists needed while they were uh, building up New England was that they needed salt. They, there was lots of fish. They didn't have any lack of that. There were lots of trees to build fishing vessels, but unless they uh, preserved the fish with salt, you know, it was just gonna spoil. <coughs> so 
it was important to have a salt works, but you know, the, 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 there was no Home Depot to go down and buy salt. Uh, so Winthrop founded a salt works at Ipswich. Uh, and he did that at a number of places in, in New England. When New England needed chemistry, Winthrop was there. He wasn't just doing Arcana. Uh, he was doing practical chemistry. And one of the first things he did was the salt works. But after the English Revolution, uh, travel between New England and England basically ceased for a while. Uh, and people weren't coming because, the, after all, now the Puritans had... Uh, <laughs> bigger fish to fry, as it were. Uh, and so Winthrop said, well, there's a solution to this problem. I'll just found an ironworks. But of course, he needed to go back to England and raise the money. So he was a capitalist. He needed to get the equipment. Uh, and he got that both in Europe and in England. And he needed skilled workers to work in the ironworks. Now, what are the odds that an iron worker was a Puritan? very low. Okay, so the Puritans needed to learn that if they were going to survive, they couldn't all be Puritans, and the iron workers were definitely not Puritans. So well, on his trip to um, capitalize the ironworks, nobody was really listening the first year he was there, and he realized that pretty quickly. So in, rather than wasting his time, he headed for Europe, and he met a lot more alchemists. One of them was a medical doctor, Johannes Tankmaris, who really taught him a lot about how to be a neatrochemical physician. Another one was the Reverend Johann Morian, uh, also a well-known uh, iatrochemical uh, doctor in Amsterdam. One of the things about Morian was that because he believed that God had given him the secrets to the chemicals he was making, that he should treat his patients for free. You say, now wait a minute, what, when was the last time a physician treated people for free? Well, they actually do it all the time. Ask a physician how much work they actually do for free. It's still, still going on. But Morion was a, a good example uh, of an iatrochemical physician that treated his patients for free. Uh, so did John Winthrop Jr. He never charged a nickel for that stuff. Now, the other thing that he met on this early part of this trip was Johann Glauber, the greatest chemist of the early 17th century. Uh, he knew how to manufacture hundreds of different kinds of things, colors, uh, things like a Glauber's salt, uh, which is sodium sulfate, uh, and many, many other things. Glauber was the man who actually knew how to do it. He founded industries in Holland and in Germany, and he and uh, Winthrop really hit it off with, with, with all these kind of people. So uh, he was very good at all these kind of things that required politics, that required finances, required chemistry, uh, and, and it required a community of people uh, to actually do the work. Now, the Hartlieb Circle, which he also visited on this, this trip, uh, included Samuel Hartlieb and people like Sir Christopher Wren, okay? Uh, John Milton, you say, I thought John Milton was a poet. You would be amazed how many poets in England were actually scientists in addition. Uh, Sir Ken Elm Dignity was an alchemist. And you say, wait a minute, his day job was a pirate. Why would he be a pirate? And the answer was that England was at war with France. And if you were a pirate, you could capture French vessels, and all you had to do was split it 50-50 with the king. So the I, the, if you say, you say, what I'm going to be when I grow up, I'm going to be a pirate and work for the king. That's who the pirates work for. Now, another person that became a good friend to John Winthrop Jr. was Benjamin Worsley. He was a natural philosopher, one of the founding members of the Royal Society. He was an alchemist, and he was a politician. So he helped uh, Winthrop a lot. And he became a good friend with Robert Boyle. Uh, how do you suppose Winthrop was able to get access to the king uh, and, to, and to people like that? Robert Boyle is the answer to that, that question. Boyle was rich. He was an alchemist. And he was a good friend of Charles II, uh, you know, who was the king after the, the, the Puritans, you know, blew it. Uh, in the English Revolution, the people said, look, enough of this stuff. We're going back to the king. Uh, Charles II was actually a very, very interesting man. Uh, and Robert Boyle was one of his bosom buddies. So this made good things for, for Winthrop. Now, 
one of the things that he learned in the Hartleib circle was that if progress was going to be made for all the world, there would need to be people whose focus was on benefiting humankind, not just on making money. There's nothing the matter with making money. Harvey Mudd is dependent on that. And Carnegie Mellon was founded by Andrew Carnegie, who believed very much in work and money. Harvey Mudd believes in work and money, just like Carnegie Mellon. So, but one of the most persistent themes in 17th century alchemy was the notion of a Puritan Solomon's house, where natural philosophers would get together for the benefit of humankind and understand the secrets of nature and then develop uh, things for the good of, of a people. And Winthrop gained a vision to do that, and he had both the political power and the vision to found such a place, which was New London, Connecticut, which still exists. Uh, but Win Winthrop is the one who founded New London, Connecticut. And as I mentioned, he treated his patients for free. His most famous medicine is called rubella. It's an anemone-based medicine, and it was colored red because people felt that a red-colored medicine actually had some efficacy to it. Uh, it did make you sweat like crazy. Now, at his alchemical plantation uh, in New London, uh, he developed lots of people to work with him, and Robert Child was one of them. Uh, another one was Richard Leader. Now, Richard Leader was the chief ironmonger at the ironworks uh, that Winthrop founded, and e eventually uh, he got tired of, of doing ironmongering, and the uh, people in England who were the capitalists uh, fired him. But uh, he didn't mind because uh, he was an alchemist and he and uh, Winthrop went on to make, make money and do, do good things otherwise. Uh, Thomas Peter uh, was his, uh, was a Puritan relative. He was married to uh, another Peter's uh, daughter. Uh, and so, and George Stirk or Starkey is the most famous literary uh, alchemist of the 17th century. And he wrote lots and lots of books in Latin uh, as, and with his pen name was Irenus Philolathes. Uh, these books are extant and the Science History Institute has real copies of all these kind of things. So I get to pet the, pet the books when I want, when I'm there. Uh, but Starkey was born on Bermuda and educated at Harvard. Why would he have gone to Harvard? Because Harvard was the best education in the English speaking world in the 17th century. Graduates from Harvard were recognized at Oxford and Cambridge as having gotten a real degree and they could go on uh, and take further courses uh, at Oxford or Cambridge if they wished. Um, so Starkey was educated at Harvard. You say Starkey was an alchemist and a medical doctor. How did he get that at Harvard? They didn't have a medical school. They didn't have a chemistry department. How did he do that? Well, it turns out that the most of the teaching at Harvard was done by the president of, of Harvard, who was a natural philosopher. And in addition you know, to, to teaching uh, the other parts of the quadrivium and the trivium, uh, he taught natural philosophy, which included chemistry uh, the theory of matter. Uh, and so Starkey uh, learned that from him. He also needed a job and as he wasn't rich. So he needed a job. So he apprenticed with a practicing iatrochemical physician in Boston. And when he graduated with a bachelor's degree from Harvard, for three years, he practiced as a medical doctor successfully in Boston while he earned his master's degree from Harvard. This is a fairly common thing, was you got a bachelor's degree and then you practice doing something for three years, then you got a master's degree and then you could, could, could do whatever you want. Uh, Starkey was like that. And the question is, well, why did he go to England? And the answer was that he was not the right kind of Puritan. And so he was really driven out of America by Puritan intolerance for other Puritans, sort of like the governor of Rhode Island, Roger Williams. Did, every, did you know that he was a Puritan, but he was the wrong kind of Puritan? So he came 
to New England on the same boat as John Winthrop Jr. when Winthrop was in charge of, of that boat. Uh, and he was a regular Puritan minister in New England for a number of years until it became clear that he was the wrong kind of Puritan. And so he founded Rhode Island. Turned out okay for us, but uh, it, it, interesting politics and religion in those days. Another friend uh, of, of Winthrop was Jonathan Brewster, who was an Indian trader and alchemist. Everybody needed to make a living, okay? So Jonathan Brewster was from the p pilgrim side of the New England. In other words, he was a child of that, of the pilgrim side, but he became a, an alchemist and an Indian trader because he needed to make money and he was good at it. And he founded a, a place to trade with the Indians pretty close to New London and then work with, with Winthrop on his alchemy. Another person who was a Harvard graduate was Gershom Bulkley. And he got an MA and, and was intending uh, to be a minister and became one. But one of the things about becoming a congregational minister in New England was that one, they were highly educated. And two, they were expected to meet all the needs of their congregation, including medical ones. And so Bulkley, like Starkey, during his master's period, apprenticed himself to a, an alchemical physician and earned the right to practice medicine in New England. He wouldn't have been allowed to practice um, in England, but there's an interesting footnote to Starkey's life. He died during the plague, the bubonic plague in London. Now, why was it that he was still in London during the bubonic plague? It's because the College of Physicians doctors all fled and only the electrochemical physicians practiced medicine during those years, and many of them died uh, because they were treating people with the plague. The last person I'm mentioning here is Emmanuel Downing, who was, his, was Winthrop's uncle and had been his uh, sponsor at uh, Dublin University uh, during those years, and you know was his boss at the Inner Temple. He was a lawyer and an alchemist, Winthrop taught him how to make money in America by distilling fine spirits. The, the Puritans were not teetotalers. How do you think they actually made it from England to North America? They brought along good brewers. They made the best beer. And in fact, after the Indians taught them about corn, they made corn beer and Winthrop served corn beer to the Royal Society, it was a big hit. But, you know, they also needed things a little stronger than, I mean, they, they drank beer three times a day, but sometimes they needed something a little stronger. And Winthrop was an alchemist. He knew how to distill things. And so he taught his uncle uh, how to make wonderful cordials and rums and uh, brandies and, and, and whatever else. So alchemy was pretty useful stuff because you really knew how to distill. Uh, and Emmanuel Downing was a good example of one of those. Now, eventually Winthrop became governor of Connecticut, uh, but, and now Charles II was back on the throne. So he went to England to get a royal charter for Connecticut. And he succeeded in doing that, but it took three years. Uh, and he had, if you're interacting with court, you end up cooling your heels most of the time. So he didn't waste his time. He became a regular at the meetings at Gresham College with royal favorites like William Brereton, Sir Robert Moray, Robert Boyle, Elias Ashmole of the Ashmolean Museum, uh, John Wilkins, John Milton, and Christopher Wren, uh, Robert Hook. Uh, so uh, he became a regular at those meetings. And so he was there during the time when the Royal Society was founded and became a founding member of the Royal Society, certainly the only American in that thing. Plus he gave talks at meetings. Uh, one of the talks, he gave lots of them, but the most famous one uh, is on preparing pine knot tar. It turns out in North America, the Indians routinely burned the old pine trees, uh, leaving the tar behind, leaving the knots behind. And Winthrop said, oh, I can dis try to still those things and get pine tar, which was needed for shipbuilding. So this was, was really important. He was able to bring all of the industries that North America needed 
uh, because he was an alchemist and, and knew how to do that kind of stuff. Now, many years later, another John Winthrop became a member of the FRS means fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, you remember the picture of Winthrop that we started with? This is John Winthrop FRS, you know, a hundred years later. He doesn't look very much like Winthrop. He was not a Puritan. He, in fact, he, he went back to England and stayed there. He liked the life in London uh, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but he was a, a fellow of the Royal Society. And one of the Winthrop traditions was to give a lot of artifacts uh, to the Royal Society. For example, a Winthrop Jr. gave them a starfish. Uh, it was a big hit at court uh, when they showed it to Charles II. Now, when John Winthrop FRS was instituted into the Royal Society, there was a special commendation given to John Winthrop Jr. by Cromwell Mortimer, the secretary of the Royal Society, which I think is worth reading to give you some idea of the impact on science uh, that, you know, this colonial uh, John Winthrop Jr. had on science is that his distant abode from London and his not putting his name to his writings made him not so universally known as the Boyles, the Wilkinses, or the Oldenburgs of his days, nor his name handed down to us with so general applause. In concert with these and other learned friends, as he often revisited England, he was one of those who first formed the plan of the Royal Society and had not the civil wars happily ended as they did, Robert Boyle, Dr. Wilkins, as may appear in letters from Mr. Boyle, Wilkins, Ken Elm Digby to Mr. Winthrop with several other learned men would have left England and out of esteem for the most excellent and valiant governor, John Winthrop the Younger would have retired to his newborn colony and there established that society for promoting natural knowledge, which these gentlemen had formed as it were in embryo among themselves, but which afterwards obtained the protection of King Charles II, obtained the style of royal and has since done so much honor to the British nations. It could have turned out differently, the Royal Society, it wouldn't have been called the Royal Society, it would have been called the Society for Promoting Natural Knowledge, could have been founded in America uh, rather than in England, just not the way it turned out. So uh, Winthrop was remarkable, not just as an alchemist, but as a person and as a politician. And because he was well known now to Charles II and his family, uh, he played an important role in the history of America as a politician as well. One of the things that he did, which was incredible, was that he had a global view of humanity. Although he was a colonial and he was a staunch defender of the uh, colony of C Connecticut, he really had a global view of humanity. And when Charles II wanted to give his brother, the Duke of York, a big birthday gift, Dutch New Amsterdam, he sent an armada, but it was quiet diplomacy by John Winthrop Jr. that convinced Peter Stuyvesant, the governor of New Amsterdam, to simply agree to a change of government with no loss of life or fortune. They didn't steal anybody's land. They didn't take away their fortune. They just gave them better governance than they were getting. Winthrop also served an important function in 17th century New England. Because he was a recognized alchemical adept, he was able to save many women who had been accused of being a witch from death. Scientists have a moral obligation to use truth for the benefit of humankind, and Winthrop was that kind of man. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience at this time? Uh, you're more than welcome to place them in the Q&A, uh, but I do have a few questions from pre-submitted, so I do want to ask you about that. Uh, which of Winthrop's ideas and actions do you think we should emulate? Which should we not and why not? Well, we, we just talked about some of those uh, important things that we should emulate. Winthrop treated all humans equally, including the Native Americans, other residents of North America. They, they weren't just from England. I mean, there were French there uh, and there were many Indian tribes. Winthrop moderated 
uh, all of them. One of the things he did from his New, Eng New London plantation was that he treated the Indians as well. They were always fighting with one another. And Winthrop would heal their wounds, but his reward for healing their wounds was that they burned New London and stole the women and children until Winthrop got them back. So you're not always rewarded for doing well, but Winthrop always chose to do well. Uh, and the fact that he, you know, he saved so many women uh, in there, he, he was the kind of politician who always saw the bigger picture. He and John, and pardon me, and Roger Williams were close friends because Williams was governor of Rhode Island and he needed to have good political interactions uh, with, uh, with Williams, and they did. They were able to bring peace to many things because they treated one another as on the same human uh, ground. That's one of the things I like most about Winthrop, not, not just that he was a great chemist, uh, but that he was a great human. He sounds like an amazing guy. Um, how much of a devout churchman or theologian was Winthrop Jr., or did he leave that to other Puritan leaders? Um, Winthrop was a Puritan, but he didn't preach. Uh, and when they were misbehaving and holding witch trials and things like that, Winthrop spent a lot of time in his salt works or in Connecticut. So he, he was devout. In fact, he and Robert Boyle was one of the most devout men of the 17th century. And he and Robert Boyle actually worked for an organization for the so-called propagation of the gospel in the colonies. So he, he interacted strongly with religious people, but he was not a bigot. Uh, and he always sought to bring people together rather than to drive them apart. Um, and he was a politician in three or four different places that he founded. In, in Ipswich, they begged him, you know, just to stay in Ipswich and and make the place a better place for all of them because he could reach out to a very wide range of people and did. Thank you. Um, our next question, can you speak more about the impact of Winthrop on the development of chemistry in, in America in the 18th century and beyond? And is there an American style of chemistry and is it influenced by Winthrop? Okay, now Winthrop among other things, knew that they were going to need saltpeter. And so he purchased an island off Connecticut on which he raised sheep and goats and whatever else. And he con collected the excrement uh, and he manufactured saltpeter. The American style of chemistry in the 17th, 18th and 19th century was very practical. They needed things and they, were willing to do it themselves. They didn't have to wait for stuff to come from abroad. Some things they did, but on the whole, the Americans were eager to actually do it themselves. And Winthrop was a good example of that because he knew all of chemistry in his time. He could apply it to practical things. And Americans chemistry in the 17th and 18th centuries was really focused on practicality. What do we need and how can we make it? So they focused on mining, they focused on various aspects having to do with wood. I mean, what resources did America have? They had lots of trees. Uh, but to people like Winthrop to get the most out of the trees, just burning them was not a great idea. And it turns out you needed trees to make salt. And the reason was it rained in New England. What do you do when it rains? You're gonna let it, the, the water wash in and get rid of your salt? No, he, he built salt boxes that you could close when the w weather got bad. So he even had, he thought like a chemical engineer and industrial chemistry uh, was not a dirty word in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, they needed people that could actually produce chemistry, not just twaddle on about phlogiston. Uh, Winthrop was the kind who knew all the theory, but was always focused on stuff you could actually do. Uh, and he delivered on the stuff that he promised to do. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, how would you describe these alchemists theory of chemistry? Why and how did it work? 
Okay, well, first, of course, it didn't work. Okay, but the, the kind of alchemical theory was Paracelsian alchemy. Uh, so it was focused on preparing arcana from real materials. Uh, and it was believed wrongly that all metals were made out of mercury and sulfur. It was just a question of how they mixed. So they had a continuous view of matter. Now we look at matter and we don't see the atoms with our eyes and neither did they. They felt that everything was actually a mixture of one kind or another. Uh, and that if you knew the right way to mix things, you could make anything starting with the fundamental materials. Uh, so there was a more sophisticated version that added salt to mercury and sulfur. Uh, and people like Glauber uh, had a mercury, salt, and sulfur thing. Uh, but of, of course, you're not going to make organic materials out of that. <laughs> so uh, Winthrop was he knew the theory, but he didn't let it stop him from accomplishing things. If what you wanted was saltpeter, it's a very complicated process to make saltpeter. And interestingly, the key element in making saltpeter is biochemical. You start with ore that actually has trapped bacteria on it that are millions, maybe billions of years old. And you grind it up and you put it in water exposed to the air and the sun, but it's the bacteria that oxidize the urine, you know, which is the key ingredient to make the nitrate. Uh, it, they're being oxidized by bacteria. So it was actually biochemical. Winthrop was all about actually doing it. He didn't get hung up. He followed, he read the books and he did the stuff, but he didn't waste his time uh, thinking about Arcana uh, when he could be actually doing stuff that benefited people like making rubella his, his medicine. So his real focus was on doing it, but of course he had all the books. He read all the stuff. The, that theory of alchemy was not correct, but it also wasn't incoherent. Uh, and there's a difference between a theory which leads to good experiments uh, and progress in understanding physical reality or chemical reality and something which is incoherent like phlogiston, which didn't ever help anybody do anything. Uh, so it, the, the theory of alchemy, the old theory of alchemy was wrong but it was not incoherent and it was actually a progressive paradigm because of the experiments that resulted uh, from what they did. Uh, probably the most famous of all the alchemists of all time was Isaac Newton. And there's a wonderful recent book by uh, William Newman uh, talking once again about Newman's practice. He spent more time doing chemistry than any other thing that he did. The thing he spent the second most time doing was religion. How many people knew that Isaac Newton was one of the most religious men of all time? You probably didn't see that in your physics books, but it's true. Uh, and by the way, he invented calculus and uh, classical mechanics and you know, optics and uh, a few things like that as well. But that's not where he spent most of his time, actually. Uh, he was an alchemist. He, he was very disappointed. He, he, was, he had a particular way of doing alchemy, which was kind of unique to Newton himself. Uh, and it didn't work. That's because it wasn't going to work. But what he did do was discover all kinds of chemicals that did result from the experiments they were doing, and as did the other alchemists. Thank you. Um, what was the role of niter beds? Okay, the, the niter beds were how you went from the urine to saltpeter, okay? And niter beds had to have the bacteria in them, otherwise they didn't work. Uh, various people thought, you know, that you could just take urine uh, and expose it to the atmosphere and the sun, uh, and they would automatically make nitrate out of it. But it's not true. Uh, what you, you needed the, uh, some nitrogenous stuff, uh, and the excrement ends up producing ammonia, uh, okay, which, which then can be oxidized to, to, to nitrate. 
but it was the uh, the night nighter beds that had the bacteria in them that actually carried out that process. So you needed to have a weak nose in order to be in the saltpeter business. Um, and in England, there were so-called Peter men, you know, you, who went into barns and into outhouses and whatever else and harvested the stuff. Uh, it was an interesting industry. Uh, to, to say the least, but some of the natural philosophers in the Royal Society wanted to speed up the process. It never worked for them because when you tried to speed it up, you didn't give the bacteria enough time to actually oxidize the uh, ammonia to, to nitrate. Uh, but once you had a going niter bed, you could add more urine and make more saltpeter. And so once it was known, it's like having a starter for making sourdough bread once you know the starter works, you don't take it all, you, you keep some back. And a niter bed was a living organism, uh, which was not understood at the time, but it is now. But biotechnology has been with us for at least 35,000 years. Wow, thank you. Um, next question, did the iron works he founded survive? And if so, what happened to them next? The ironworks that he founded is actually a natural, uh, a, uh, a national park now. It's at Saugus in Massachusetts. Uh, the buildings have been recreated and they work. Okay, uh, making iron is not an easy process. Uh, first, you need a source of iron. Uh, it turns out that Massachusetts is loaded with iron because there are all these bogs. The water comes up from above and there are bacteria in the bogs that reduce the iron to a form called bog iron. It's a hydrated iron oxide. Uh, and you can use that to, to actually make pig iron. So first you needed a source and there, are plenty of, there was plenty of bog iron. Uh, you need trees because you have to make charcoal. Uh, but most people who try to make charcoal just end up burning the house down you needed skilled workers who knew how to make charcoal. Well, Winthrop imported them from England. Uh, that, so you do that. Uh, in a, then you need to beat the pig iron to make wrought iron. And the, the, the iron work was called Hammersmith. And you have these water driven hammers. So you needed power. Where do you get power in Massachusetts? From the rivers. So uh, he actually founded two sites. One of them was Saugus, where the Hammersmith Works was. And he also founded one at Braintree, uh, where they, they got things going, uh, but eventually they had a better site there. But throughout New England, people figured out water power was going to be how it was going to make many things happen, including iron work, because you needed to beat the iron. Then you needed to slit it turn it into rods, make nails out of it. The Hammersmith Works did all of that. It's a wonderful national park and it's online. I mean, you, you can go online and see it and it's in my book. I mean, you, I have an entire chapter on the Hammersmith Smith Works in, in, in my book. So feel free to buy it. It's, it's on Amazon. Great, thank you. Um, so our, for our final, I'll actually have two other questions. Okay, so. Uh, if you could go back in time and ask Winthrop a few questions, what would you ask him? Ah, uh, if I could ask Winthrop questions. Hmm, that's, that is a really good, a good question. I'd probably ask him how he was able to negotiate the treacherous political worlds in which he traveled and stay alive because so many people were being killed for one reason or another. Uh, he, Roger Williams fled to Rhode Island, but other people were killed. Uh, he wasn't killed. Other people were arrested, like his friend Robert Child, well, you know, would spend time in jail. Uh, why? Because he was the wrong kind of Puritan and he sent a remonstrance to the governors of Massachusetts reminding them that they were citizens of England and that they were obligated under the crown 
to allow worship according to the laws of the Church of England. Whereas in Connecticut, you had to be a Connecticut Puritan in order to vote, hold office, and sometimes even eat. So the idea of sending a remonstrance to the politicians uh, did not go down well. They fined him a king's ransom. 200 pounds in those days was a king's ransom. They find him a king's ransom for having the audacity to remind them that they were violating the rights of British citizens in what they were doing in Massachusetts. But they, they, they were not eager to hear that from him. So he went, went back to England. Great, thank you. So our final question. Uh, seems like a lot of the famous people from this era were uh, alchemist types. How were they viewed in society at large? Eccentric rich people, creative geniuses? The, it, various kinds. I mean, one thing you could do as an alchemist is that you could bring your family into poverty. And J Jonathan Brewster b basically spent too much money on the alchemy and his wife, wife and children suffered, suffered quite a bit. But people like Winthrop uh, were viewed as the single most desirable citizen in any town. Uh, one of the other colonies uh, was New Haven. Uh, perhaps people didn't realize that New Haven was a colony all unto itself until Winthrop got a charter for Connecticut and conveniently included New Haven as part of Connecticut. Now, he was good friends with the people in New Haven. They tried to get Winthrop to come and be the governor of New Haven, uh, but Connecticut succeeded. And it was objectively better for New Haven to join Connecticut at that point in history because they had a charter. But uh, because Winthrop was a physician who healed people, he was an industrialist who made money and jobs for people. He was viewed very, very positively in New England. Sometimes in Europe, alchemists were viewed negatively and they were spending a lot of time. Paracelsus spent half his time in jail. You know, many of the famous alchemists, even John Dee spent time in jail at the court of Rudolf II. Uh, what do you suppose alchemists did while they were in jail in royal courts? Alchemy. The the, rule, the emperor was hoping that they would succeed in jail, uh, but he didn't want them roaming around and giving the money to somebody else. It was illegal to practice alchemy unless you were working for the king. That was true in France. Okay, where do you think Louis the? Why do you think Louis the Fourteenth spent so much money on alchemy? Because he needed money. So the most famous alchemists in France in the in the seventeenth century, eighteenth century, uh, were were working for Louis the Fourteenth. Okay, so, but Winthrop uh, didn't waste his time trying to make gold, okay? He, 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 most of his stuff was other things. He would have been thrilled to make the Philosopher's Stone if he could, but of course it doesn't exist. Uh, but Winthrop was positively viewed because he put his knowledge to use for the commonwealth in which he lived. And, you know, that he was a, one of the greatest scientists of the 17th century, but he was not in it f just for himself. He was in it for all of humankind. That's something I like most about Winthrop is that he was a man for all seasons. Thank you, Gary. Um, thank you so much for being here on Mud Talks. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge and insights with us. Thank you to our audience for your questions and for attending this event. We will follow up in within the next week with a recorded video. Next up in our Mud Talk series is Science Policy for Every Mudder with Paul Jerger, class of 15, on Thursday, May 20th at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Registration is now open on our website. All upcoming events can be found on our online offerings page using the link included in your confirmation email or by visiting alumni.hnc.edu and clicking on online offerings. We welcome any suggestions you may have for upcoming events, or if you are interested in hosting one, please email us at alumni at hmc.edu. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Uh, Thank you, thanks, Mary. Thanks to Harvey Mudd uh, and the Board of Governors uh, of the Alumni Association, and for Vanessa, you know, for making this a fun event. Thank you, Gary. We'll see you next time.